Hello and welcome to the exciting new features in NRF Connect SDK version 1.9. Uh, I'm one of your hosts today. My name is Bjorn Kvole. I'm a product marketing engineer at Nordic Semiconductor. And with me, I have uh, Paul Kostnes, who's a technical marketing manager for short range wireless, and also Martin Lesson, who's a technical marketing manager for cellular IoT. Uh, just some quick practicalities before we get started. So the duration will be 45 minutes, roughly, with a 15-minute Q&A at the end. Um, questions are encouraged. Um, please type the questions in the top of the right sidebar. You should see something similar to this. So please just you know type your questions there. Uh, these questions are anonymous. Try to keep them relevant to the topic, and we will answer during the Q&A at the end. Um, the chat on the bottom right of your screen is not anonymous and should not be used for questions. If you do have any more questions at the end, feel free to go to Nordic DevZone. Uh, that's devzone.nordicsemi.com. And a recording of the webinar will be available together with the presentation at webinars.nordicsemi.com slash on demand. So just a quick agenda. I'll just give a quick intro um, to NRF Connect SDK and basic terminology, and then I'll hand over to Paul for the short range updates, and I'll hand and then uh, Martin will go through the cellular IoT updates before we go through uh, the Q and A at the end. So communities, we do have a lot of different webinars that give nice you know, technology intros, trainings, just go to nordicsemi.com slash webinars. You can sign up to future webinars. And at the bottom, you should see this nice uh, big box saying on-demand webinars. Just click on that and you can see all of the different uh, on, yeah, the different webinars, webinar recordings that we have already done. Um, we also have a Nordic developer zone. That's our basically our tech support center and online community. It's a very vibrant, friendly community. Um, last I checked, we had you know 80,000 different posts in the Q&A section. Um, we do have roughly you know, between 30 and 40 engineers basically working there full time, just answering your questions. And we do answer questions, whether it's you know a tier one customer or whether it's a student, we, we do you know, pride ourselves on answering all questions. Um, we also have Nordic GitHub, which has a bunch of different repositories, uh, mainly written in C, but we also have some C++, Python, and JavaScript repositories. So feel free to go to that link if that sounds interesting. Okay, so with that out of the way, I'll go through the intro. Um, NRF Connect SDK, it does provide one code base and tool chain for the NRF 91, NRF 50. Three, NRF 52 and NRF 21 series. Um, the NRF 91 series is our cellular IoT um, series. And then the 52 and the 53, that is our short range. So you can see, for example, Bluetooth uh, Low Energy, Bluetooth Mesh, Thread Zigbee. Those are some of the supported protocols there. And the NRF 21 series is our uh, range extender. So it includes an RF, uh, NRF 21540 RF front end module for 2.4 gigahertz range extension. Um, I'll talk a bit about the NRF 52 series and how you can use both NRF 5 SDK and NRF Connect SDK. Um, here you can see just some of the protocols that are supported, uh, some of the main ones LTM, narrowband IoT, GPS. I mentioned the others here. We also have support for Matter, ESB, Gazelle, and NFC. But, you know, just check out the documentation if you want uh, more information on that. And regarding Bluetooth, uh, there on Bluetooth for Energy, we're version 5.2 qualified host and controller stack since version 141. So I can actually just show you quickly. So here you can see if we go to Info Center, and let's say I want to go to the NRF 5340 SOC. I can go to compatibility matrix and Bluetooth QDIDs. And here you can actually see the NRF Connect SDK version, um, the host subsystem, the QDID, 
and you can see the soft device controller. So this is our Nordics controller implementation. And here you can see the QDID for uh, version 5.2. And the same then for the different, if you want to use the 50 to 840, you'd have to go here and you'd find the same uh, navigation structure there. Okay, so for the, for the NRF52 series, um, you can use these for SDKs. So we have different NRF5 SDKs or the NRF Connect SDK. Um, if you want to use the NRF5 SDK, that's good if you don't require a real-time operating system. And it's also if you're used to this SDK and you don't require newer features after Bluetooth 5.0, Bluetooth Mesh 1.01, .01, Thread 1.1 or Zigbee 3.0. So it could be a yeah, could be a good idea to use that if if you're used to it. NRF5 SDK is in maintenance mode. Just be aware of that. So that means you know major bug fixes will still be done. But basically newer features after these ones, they will be um, supported in NRF Connect SDK. Um, we do have a statement for more information, but basically. If you're just getting started on a new design, we definitely recommend you to, you know, uh, try out the NRF Connect SDK. Just quickly on the code base, so we do. The code base does contain, you know, the application code, connectivity protocols that I mentioned, uh, wireless stacks, and peripheral drivers all in one place. Um, there are seven main repositories both Nordic and open source code. So here on the right, you can see the blue is the uh, Nordic source code and the purple is open source code. But the Nordic source code and the open source uh, source code is provided with very uh, you know, permissive licenses, which means you can easily use it on your end application. Um, so I'll just go quickly through some of the main repositories. You have the NRF repository that contains a lot of the applications and samples for easily getting started. A lot of the connectivity protocols are also included there. On the NRFX slip side, we have uh, Artos independent libraries. So for example, the modem library um, is included there. Uh, in the Zephyr repository, we have the real-time operating system in addition to you know board configuration, uh, et cetera, um, and MCU boot that includes you know the secure bootloader for firmware upgrades. So just going through some of the basic terminology, Git you're probably aware of already. So I'll just skip past that one. Um, West is a command line tool for multi-repository management and also building and flashing examples. So it's a very useful tool, um, especially yeah, if you want to say switch between different uh, versions, different tagged versions of NRF Connect SDK, you can easily use uh, the West tool for that. A repository is just a version controlled project folder. So for example, the NRF repository. And one thing to note is that every code commit does create a repository version with a unique identifier the unique SHA identifier. Uh, for the tag, this points to a specific commit SHA identifier. So that's immutable, it doesn't change. So here you can, for example, see a major tag. So for example, version 1.0 and a minor tag, this could be version 1.9, for example. And that, that code is not changing. Um, whereas the main branch, used to be called uh, master branch. It's been renamed to uh, main branch. That basically always points to the most recent commit SHA. So that's always changing. Uh, one thing to note also for the tag is we do have Nordic dev zone support available. Um, whereas for the main branch, we do not have Nordic uh, dev zone support available. And the main reason for this is that for the tags, you know, these are release tested. We do a lot of continuous integration. So it is, uh, yeah, um, most of the major bugs are fixed there. Whereas for this is not always the case uh, for the main branch. Um, also for the main branch, if you want to do start testing newest features, it can be a good idea, you know, to try it out in the main branch first before the tag comes out. But that's, yeah, 
you'll have to decide that for yourself. Um, so source code and configuration. I mentioned quickly the West tool for multi-repository management um, for cloning and updating. So here you have the NRF Connect SDK with the different repositories. You can add your code. That then becomes your code base. One file that's very useful to mention is the west.yaml file. I can actually show you that quickly. So here we see the west.yaml file for version 1.9.0 tag. It's included inside the NRF repository folder. And the main thing I wanted to show here is that the west.yaml file actually shows which revision of the other repositories it points to. So you can see the Zephyr repository points to this revision. You can see MCU boot points to this revision, etc. So that's actually a very, just a useful file to uh, be aware of. Um, for kconfig, that's basically just configuring software features. Um, so the basically the software features are configured inside the kconfig file. And then you have a project configuration file for each of the different applications normally. And this is where you can basically enable and disable uh, different software features. And then last but not least, you have the device tree. So that's how you basically describe the device. So the hardware side of things. That's how you configure the target. And the device tree file often has a DTS. Well, it has a DTS uh, at the end. That can be different than depending on whether you know you have a Thingy 91 or let's say a NRF 52840 40 development kit that will have different, you know, different GPIO mappings, et cetera. Just quickly on release cycles, we do have regular releases roughly uh, on a quarterly basis. It is publicly hosted on GitHub. I can just show you quickly. So if you go here to this page, you can actually see all of the different tags and when they were released. Um, fixes are released as needed. So also long-term supported releases can have fixes applied and delivered after new releases. I think this is what this image here is trying to show that uh, if this is a long-term release and this is a minor tag, uh, this fix here might come actually after the minor tag has already been uh, released. Um, but the latest development version, so the main branch is also available and the version control management is done with uh, Git. Um, we used to call features supported for development uh, and supported for production, but now we've actually moved over to experimental versus supported. Um, so experimental features, they may be used for development, but they're not recommended for volume production. Uh, we do have technical support available for the tagged versions of NRF Connect SDK. Um, reported bugs may not be resolved until feature or the component is supported. Uh, implementation may be partial. APIs may also change, moving from experimental to supported. Um, <clears throat> On the verification side, it, it it's incomplete. So it's very suitable for prototyping and evaluation. Um, supported features, on the other hand, are suitable for integration in end products. Again, technical support is available there for tagged versions. Um, reported critical bugs will be resolved in both the main and the latest tag of NRF Connect SDK. Implementations there are complete as well as being verified for product development. Um, so moving on to the documentation, I'll actually go to the documentation to show you this quickly. So here we can see the documentation at developer.nordicsemi.com. Um, this actually points to the main branch of the documentation. And up here, we can actually go through to the different uh, tagged versions of NRF Connect SDK. So here we can see version 1.9.0, for example, of the documentation. And I just want to point to the fact that down here on the bottom, this is where you can change between the different documentations for the different repositories. 
And here you can actually also see that version 1.9.0 of NRF Connect SDK points to these different revisions of the different repositories. So it's very similar to what I said with the west.yaml file previously. So if you want to go to matter, you can, for example, see the matter documentation there. Okay, let's move back to the uh, presentation. So on the ID support, we have NRF Connect for VS Code. This is our own extension to the very popular uh, VS Code ID. Highly ex extendable, configurable. We do have both the CLI and GUI interfaces, cross-platform support. You do have a create new board wizard, which can be very useful and uh, you know easy to get started. And we do have some nice uh, tutorial videos too. So I can just show you quickly the uh, product page here. Um, and here you can actually see, yeah, we have some information here. We do have a nice webinar, which can be good uh, to watch to get an intro to VS Code. And we have some cool tutorial videos at the bottom here showing you how to install, etc. You know, how to build, how to flash, uh, etc. And this will then help with installation of both uh, NRF Connect for VS Code, but also NRF Connect SDK. We also have support for Sega Embedded Studio Nordic Edition. Um, that also has cross-platform support. Um, if you want to use any other ID, it can be used with NRF Connect SDK, but then just be aware that you don't have uh, NRF Connect SDK uh, or toolchain integration. Um, if you're just getting started, I would definitely recommend trying NRF Connect for VS Code. This provides you know, the easiest uh, unboxing experience and easiest getting started experience. So yeah, that is it from my side. Hi, so I will be taking over from now. So my name is Paul Kostnes. I'm a technical marketing manager with Nordic uh, from the headquarters in Trondheim. Uh, so first, a little bit of generic updates. Um, one of the things we have added with uh, version 1.9 uh, is support for the microbit version 2. So the microbit has been in the market for quite some time. It's a very nice and flexible platform for doing for doing demonstrations and so on. It's been used in a lot of uh, schools for educational purposes. Um, and the target for this is to be a versatile programmable IoT device. Uh, and it comes with a lot of, of features to help uh, students play with it. So it's got a small LED matrix, it's got buttons, it's got uh, touch sensor, it goes motion sensors, um, both accelerometers and, uh, and magnetometers, as well as audio feedback to microphone and speaker. <coughs> there is edge connector to um, to connect to, to various accessories, so you can expand it and, and build additional features to it. Uh, the microbit, uh, the original version, has been supported in the NRF Connect SDK and in Zephyr for quite some time. Uh, but now we have also upgraded to support the, the latest version, which is the V2 version. Um, this is an upgrade compared to the to the previous version uh, by the fact that they have changed the SOC that's being used on it. The, the previous version used the 51A22, where you had a 256K byte of, of flash, uh, while now we are moving to the 52A33, which is has a, a 512 k byte of flash and a lot more RAM. So you can run more advanced applications. It also has a higher speed uh, CPU because we have a Cortex-M4 versus the Cortex-M0 that was on the previous version. As you can see on the back side here, uh, you have a USB connector that connects directly to the interface MCU, which means that there is a debugger and programmer on the, on the board. So you will be able to, to both program and, and debug uh, code running on the device. It has a drag and drop functionality, so you can just drag code onto the board and it will run. Um, so it's, it's a nice kit because it contains a lot of things you can use for, for building very small and, and, and self-contained applications on the board without having to, um, to extend it. Uh, and it also is, the, the form factor is, is very small, so it's very um, say convenient if you're going to do a little bit of prototyping. Uh, so we're seeing that this is being used a lot for the for the original design. They used it with uh, with higher level languages, with MicroPython, with Java Java based solutions. Uh, but we're also seeing that there is a lot of cases where 
how to say, uh, students want to move over to start programming in C and so on. And that's why we, we see this as a very valuable addition to be able to support this phone directly from the, from the Connect SDK. Uh, one additional thing we have added is uh, updates to the Quad SPI driver. Um, so we have had a Quad SPI driver in the Connect SDK for, for some time, but it has lacked one very important feature that we are now adding, which is the power management functionality. Um, so this one allows you to use uh, a couple of new simple APIs to, to suspend and resume uh, the use of the external flash. And when you do that, it will automatically shut down the, the external flash, move it to the deep uh, power down mode. Uh, it will also deactivate the Quad SPI interface, and when you want to resume, it will it will reinitialize everything and get things up and running. So this one helps out with uh, allowing you to use external memory and still maintain a very low power consumption. And uh, we have had support for this for standard SPI flash for a while, uh, but now we added it for the Quad SPI device as well. Then over to short range updates. So we had some new features coming in. One of them is for the soft device controller. Uh, with the version 1.8, we added uh, experimental support for periodic advertising. Now this has been taken out of experimental. Uh, it will be uh, covered by the QDID for the soft device controller that is embedded in the NF Connect SDK version 1.9. Uh, as soon as the certification is completed, then we will of course upload the QDID to the info center. Um, the periodic advertising is a feature that is future looking for us. And uh, the main drivers or the main use cases for it is with, uh, with direction finding as well as with audio. Um, we will implement some additional features to enable these in the, in the coming, uh, coming releases. Uh, but being able to, to get the periodic advertising certified is a big step on the way towards supporting these features in the, in the software device controller as well. Then over to Matter. Uh, Matter is a project being run by uh, by the CSA, so the Connected Standards Alliance. It was used to be known as Project Connected Home over IP or Project Chip, and it is a standard for unifying the smart home industry to make sure that the, you can buy devices from multiple vendors that will be compatible with multiple infrastructures, so you'll be able to use them by. Uh, on a lot of different platforms. And as you can see, the, the, the found, among the founding partners is Apple, Amazon, Google, as well as Samsung. So you have a lot of the, the smart home infrastructures will also support Matter when the spec is uh, finalized and being released to the market. It is still in, uh, in, in progress, in works in the CSA. Uh, we are working with it to make sure that we are uh, able to deliver a solution as soon as the spec is out. We are doing uh, demonstrations of this at trade shows. We did a nice demonstration at, at CES where you can see uh, all of the features or a lot of different products linked up together. Um, one of the new things that we have added with, uh, with version uh, 1.9 is support for frustration-free setup. So this is a extension uh, driven by Amazon. Um, and it, the target is to, um, to allow customers to buy products uh, from Amazon, uh, get them delivered home, unbox them, plug them into the, the power supply, they, and then get them automatically added to the network. Everything's set up, no need to do any kind of, kind of configuration, go to any set of visits and so on. Um, so it's all about being able to get your, uh, your new home automation solution working without any frustration. Um, so we have been collaborating with Amazon for, for some time with uh, trying to make the, uh, to make matter and to make the home automation systems work better and being easier. Um, and, uh, and also to be make it easier for our users to implement these new features that are coming from the Amazon side. Um, so we have now added experimental support in the Connect SDK version 1.9. Um, for this, it is not a qualified solution. Uh, uh, we are uh, going through the qualification now, and we hope to be able to get it certified 
uh, soon so that we will have it available as a certified solution as soon as the, the matter uh, specification is released uh, fully to the market. Um, we also made some updates to Zigbee. Um, so we updated the Zigbee solution on the 5340. We have had experimental support for it uh, up front, but now it is no longer experimental. It's a uh, Zigbee platform certification compliant. We are going to certify it, so we are working on getting the certification completed. Um, we are also adding experimental support for Zigbee cluster library version 8, as well as for Zigbee based device behavior version 3.0.1. So this is called BDB 301 uh, and SCL 8. Uh, one important thing to have in mind is that today we are able to have a certified uh, platform with the older versions of the cluster library and the older version of Zigbee based device behavior. Uh, but from April this year, uh, all products uh, that are to be uh, certified needs to be using the SCL 8 and the BDB 301. Um, uh, because of this, we have to, we are working on getting these supported uh, and have them uh, for production release in the next release of the NR Connect SDK. And have in mind that um, we don't expect to see any significant uh, impact with this. So expectation is that if you start working with the current version uh, and then uh, want to upgrade to the release version with the next tag, uh, it will be a fairly simple process to do that. We don't expect API changes and so on. Then over to probably the biggest new feature that was added in NF Connect SDK version 1.9, which is support for the Nordic Distance Toolbox. Uh, so this is a new functionality that's been added to the SDK. This is a, a Nordic Distance Measurement solution where we are also combining the distance measurement together with, uh, with Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, this is the, the NDT part is a Nordic proprietary solutions, so it will only work with, with Nordic devices. Um, and it's a lot better and a lot more advanced than what we have been able to deliver before. This is use, utilizing phase-based ranging uh, to get a much better control of the distance. And so this is, of course, an initial release, so it's experimental support only. We will, of course, move this one towards production uh, over the coming releases. And currently, when you download it today, it will support the 52.833 and the 52.840. Uh, you have the build targets or the DKs for these devices. Um, and you will be able then to open the sample, uh, which is well documented in the, in the documentation for the Connect SDK. You will be able to see how it works and, and uh, what kind of data you can get out of it. Um, if you're looking at the output, we have two different uh, ranging Options here, one one is the phase-based solution, which ranges up to eight to 10 meters. If you go any further than that, you are starting to risk getting incorrect data. It depends a little bit on the environment and so on, but uh, we have seen that you can go longer, but the recommendation is to use it up to around eight meters. Uh, this is the most accurate ranging solution available through NDT. Uh, and we are doing the phase-based ranging and we run multiple algorithms on the data to be able to uh, to extract the, the distance, um, but the key part here is as well, so we are picking, uh, we also have uh, logic inside the, the driver, which is doing the ranging, uh, where we do a best fit, when we can also you just pick out the best value uh, based on the, on the input data we have available. Um, so we also have a, a longer range support with round trip timing. Um, this one is less accurate than phase-based ranging. So it gives you a much longer range as long as we can get the, the, the signal going back and forth between the two devices, we will be able to do the round trip timing. Uh, but the accuracy, or how to say the, the step size is, is significantly larger. So um, it won't give you a very good result if the distance is short. That's why we have support for both of them. So you can use the, 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 the round trip timing to find out how far away you are. And if you're inside the area where the phase base is doing better, you can start using phase based ranging to also find out um, how accurate it is. So one of the reasons why we have added support for, uh, for the NDT 
uh, is because that is the the way we have done this previously and the way that's typically been done with Bluetooth is to use um, RSSI where you're just looking at the, the the intensity of the of the signal. You measure measure how how strong signal you are receiving on the receiver side. It's very simple to do that. All devices support RSSI. The problem or the limitation with RSSI-based solutions is that it's depending on something called the, the path loss factor, and this one is not known. It changes depending on the environment you're in. Everything will uh, will vary quite a lot. And because of that, we are seeing that, yeah, it's very difficult to get reliable uh, ranges with, with RSSI. If you saw back on the previous slide, we did actually use RSSI on the, in the NDT, but we only use it to check if you're inside a very, very short distance, up to half a meter, you can be, uh, you can get good results as long as there's nothing in between the antennas. Uh, as soon as you start moving things around, if you have a body in the area and so on, you get problems, RSSI doesn't give a, a really good result. Um, and instead, when you're using the phase-based ranging, uh, we are changing, uh, we are measuring the the phase shift over the frequency band where we're operating in. And since we are operating in a 2.4 gigahertz band from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.48, we are able to check the, the, the phase shift over all of these frequencies. And by doing that, we will be able then to uh, to calculate out the distance. So it's a really nice extension to the to what we have been able to do before, and it allows us to do make new functionality uh, and to um, to open up new possibility for 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 you guys. So you can build solutions where you can actually do ranging. Um, and of course, we are going to add support for for other devices as well in the family. Uh, so there will be more devices being added with uh, with the coming releases uh, of the entity. And we're also planning to do a, a webinar where we'll go in much more details into um, into the entity and uh, talk more about how this is. So please stay uh, stay tuned and um, and watch um, our uh, our webinar site to see when uh, when we open up for uh, registration for that. Hello, my name is Martin Lesun, and I'm a technical marketing manager for Cellular IoT. I'm going to guide you through all new Cellular IoT related updates for NRF Connect SDK version 1.9. First off, I just want to talk about our complete low power Cellular IoT solution. So we have the NRF 9160 system in package on the left hand side here. And it has a dedicated application processor and memory. It also has a very low power multi-mode LTM and NB-IoT modem with integrated radio frequency front end and GNSS support. It has been built from ground up by Nordic to be ultra low power. In the middle here, we have the NRF Connect environment. This includes the NRF Connect software development kit, the NRF Connect for desktop application that you run on your computer to do different stuff with our Nordic devices. And also the NRF Cloud, that is our cloud solution. It has now launched different uh, services, such as the location service. On the right hand side, we have the NRF 9160 development kit and the Thingy 91 prototyping platform. So basically, these two devices include uh, an eSIM from uh, iBasis when you buy it and also it utilizes the NREF52840 as a board controller, but it can also be used with Bluetooth Low Energy, so you can basically uh, make uh, LTE and Bluetooth Low Energy gateways application. And also we have uh, LTE, GNSS and 2.4 GHz antennas on these two devices. So now just an overview of the 9160 and how the NRF Connect SDK is in this uh, manner. So on the left hand side, we can just see a diagram of the 9160. We have the power management IC and uh, passives and crystals, everything inside here, and also the RF front end inside. And in the middle, you can see the application processor with it, or which it has its own ARM Cortex-M33 
and then also ARM Trust Zone and ARM CryptoCell, as well as its dedicated flash and RAM. You have one megabyte of flash and 256 kilobytes of RAM. We have also support for uh, several peripherals, UART, I2C, and also uh, SBI, etc. And also, of course, we have the LTM and NBIT modem with GPS support. So basically, you only need a power source. This could be a battery connected and different sensors connected base, uh, based on your application. And you have a connection to your SIM card. This could be a plastic SIM or an eSIM. And you have uh, two knee connect uh, antennas. This could be GPS and LTE. On the right hand side, you can see a more closer look into our application core and our modem core. You can start with the modem core. So we uh, at Nordic deliver the modem firmware here. Uh, our latest modem firmware is the 131. And it includes everything from TLS, DTLS support, TCP, UDP support, the IPv4, IPv6 stack, the GPS, and the lower parts of the network stack as well. And this has been certified uh, by several carriers, so you can look on our certification page for the details there. And on application core, you have the NREF Connect software de development kit running. Uh, Develop, uh, and depending on your application needs, you can either uh, enable and disable different protocols. We have support for HTTP, MQTT, lightweight machine to machine, and co -op. And we have also uh, several uh, libraries that can help you out in different use cases. And uh, in between the modem and the application core, we have the modem library, which is APIs that you use to communicate with the modem. And on top of uh, here, you can run different libraries and modules that you can, uh, for example, have the NERF Cloud, the AVS, uh, Azure location libraries, uh, firmware over the air libraries enabled, depending entirely on your application needs that you run on the top here. Now I'm just going to go through the new updates we have done in 1.9 uh, NREF Connect SDK. First off, we have uh, done some changes in the documentation, specifically for the getting started with Thingy91 guide and getting started with the NREF9160 DK guide. These guides have now been moved to the NREF Connect SDK documentation page from the Info Center, as well been uh, reworked uh, with new information. We have also reworked and renamed the Working with Thingy91 and NRF9160 DK user guides. Uh, they are now named Developing with Thingy91 and Developing with 9160. So basically, when you get started, you go into the Getting Started documentation, and you, when you want to start to develop on your devices, you can go into the Developing with uh, guides. It's more detailed and showcasing more specific parts uh, than just the getting started pages. Now over to the modem uh, related stuff. The latest modem firmware is the 131. Uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, we have the full changelog link here and also the compatibility matrix showcasing which uh, version of the modem firmware you should use together with which version of the NREF Connect SDK version. And the modem library has been updated to 151. We have replaced proprietary sockets with NREF modem APIs that include link time optimization, so thereby you reduce the memory use usage. We also removed the DFU and AT sockets. Uh, this was deprecated in uh, modem library 131, but now they have been removed completely. And also some uh, different general bugs, bug fixes improvements has been included. For more details, we have all the links included in this slide here, so you can just click on and look into the change log for more details. With regards to more device management related stuff, we have the lightweight machine to machine carrier library updated. Uh, this is a library you need to enable when you're going to certify for some specific carriers. This is also listed on our websites, which carrier that uh, needs this enabled. 
And for this library, we have now added an event that triggers when you are using an unregistered SIM card. And also we have removed dependencies on deprecated libraries and also add, added dependencies for the uh, AT monitor library in the glue layer. And the uh, uh, lightweight machine to machine client utils library. Uh, this is uh, based on Zephyr's lightweight machine to machine stack. This is basically a library that you can enable and use to make your own device management on your application uh, side. We have now added support for the Lightbit Machine to Machine object uh, and enhanced cell ID signal measurement information, which is uh, useful for doing LT location. So to get uh, the location of your device using the LT network instead of the uh, GPS. And also we have updated the FOTA download library, the firmware over the air download library, which you use to update your application or your modem firmware on your device over the air. We have now uh, added the support to skip the host name check when you are connecting to a TLS service using just the IP address. And also we have standardized the bootloader firmware over the air download to accept only full dual path names as the example shows here. We have also several updates on the library side. I'm not going to go through all of them, so I encourage you to look into this uh, changelog here uh, linked for all the details. And now over to some updates uh, related to the NREF cloud as well. Uh, we have uh, now updated the user guide with some uh, documentation on choosing a protocol is a section around if you should use MQTT or REST and gives you some details around this. And also we have now a new feature called filtered ephemeris. This is basically uh, that you are filtering out ephemeris from satellites that's below the horizon. So the uh, satellites that your device is not seeing. And this improves the assisted GPS download size by more than two times. So assisted GPS is basically uh, that you are downloading the ephemeris and almanac data through the LT network instead of the satellites themselves to, to save power and also uh, time to get your uh, GPS fix. And now this, uh, this size, download size has been halved this means that you will use uh, less current and less time to get this data and also to get your GPS fix. This is supported uh, by location API and sample. We have also updated this in the GNS sample and the modem shell sample and also the asset tracker version to application. This is also highlighted on the NREF cloud frontend. So now you can showcase the GPS and the multi-cell and single cell on the map itself and see the accuracy of these location services that uh, NREF Cloud provides. So we can see the GPS in purple here and that's the place that this thing in to one that was used in this testing is located. And we can see that the multi-cell is uh, less accurate and the single cell is even less accurate. However, multi-cell and single cell is a very low power compared to using the GPS. And we can see that the, the multi-cell is using several uh, base station while the single cell is just using the location of one base station. First off, I want to say that the Asset Tracker version 1 has been removed from this SDK, NREF Connect SDK version 1.9. It was deprecated, I think, two versions of the SDK uh, ago, but uh, now it's removed completely. So uh, all new uh, applications that uh, you have based on version 1 should uh, move to version 2, basically, is recommended. And for uh, Asset Tracker version 2, we have now added support for this NREF Cloud assisted uh, GPS filtered ephemeris that I talked about. And also we have added a lot of new documentations for the following modules. 
I'm not going to go through all of them, but this application has now been heavily documented and is a great starting point for any acid tracker applications. And also we have now included the atmospheric pressure readings retrieved from the BME 680 sensor that's located on the Thingy 91. We also improved uh, for predicted GPS and for those that don't know, uh, predicted GPS is basically the same as uh, assisted GPS, but that you download a larger uh, part of the assistant data that lasts longer. So you can turn off the LTE network for a longer period of time and still have valid assisted GPS data. And also some general uh, improvements and bug fixes here as well. For the serial LT modem, this is an application that you use uh, if you're going to use the 9160 just as the modem and use an external microcontroller unit to communicate uh, with the device. Now we have added documentation and support for running the SLM application on the Thingy 91 and also added a two wire interface AD commands and also added a XLM UART command to set the baud rate and hardware flow control in runtime if this is enabled. Other samples that updated is the HTTP application update sample. It has support for application downgrade. And also modem shell example has now added commands to connect to Venerv Cloud uh, and also use uh, AGPS filtered ephemeris. Also uh, various PPP updates. Also added uh, some updates to the GNSS sample. We have support for minimal assistance and now also support for TTFF test mode, which you can use to test out cold start using AGPS uh, Basically, it's a very good starting point to evaluate the GNSS on our 9160. Also, of course, added a GPS filter mode here on this sample. And also for the lightweight machine to machine sample, we have added support for triggering neighbor cell measurements. And to end this uh, section on cellular IoT updates, I want to talk about our tools for saving power we have the online power profiler, which is an online calculator to use to estimate the power consumption of your 9160. And you can set up different scenarios uh, with your application sending different uh, amounts of size of data or using UDP uh, on this uh, calculator and set different network parameters. So you can actually see what draws current and estimate uh, the typical uh, power consumption on your device. And to actually measure current, you have our Power Profiler Kit 2, and you can measure uh, the current consumption with this tool uh, and track this and save this and use it to debug and actually see what draws current. And also we have a power optimization guide, which uh, highlights all the tips and tricks to optimize your application for low power. That's all from the cellular IT updates. Thank you very much.